Dear friends, thank you for supporting this channel on Patreon to join our growing family of donors, now 59 patrons strong. And remember, once we reach 100 active patrons, we will start sending out a one ounce U.S. Silver Eagle, autographed by your host, Donegan Kaiser, to one active supporter each and every month. Thanks for taking a minute to pitch in by going to patreon.com slash Reluctant Preppers and pledging your support today. Thanks very much. Hey, Reluctant Preppers. This is showing you just how easy it is to purchase silver without paying any premium over spot price. You just go to sdbullion.com slash rp, scroll down and enter the special code to get silver without any premium, and they'll mail it to your mailbox, discreetly packaged, Inside you'll find a beautiful 10 ounce bar of fine silver and you are able to purchase that and have it and add it to your stack and your collection without paying any premium. And you're supporting reluctant preppers along the way. Thanks. As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. It's been a long time since we've had this experienced guest and survival coach. Brad Harris is the founder of Full Spectrum Survival, and he's here with us again on Reluctant Preppers. Brad, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Dan, again for having me, and thank you, everybody, for listening. It's uh, a real treat when we can get you on here because you really take us to the heart of the survival and preparedness community. You're so well connected to many people in this community who are exploring different aspects of, you know, communications and uh, and supplies and skills. And you've been a real advocate for physical practice and getting your skills. Uh, developed and built and having plans and preparedness. A lot of people focus so much on just having stockpiles of goods and you are always a very uh, responsible voice reminding people that if you aren't practicing in times of calm how to do all those things, build a smokeless fire and on and on and on, do all those things, forage and orient and that kind of stuff. Um, those skills won't be at your, at your ready when you're in an emergency situation. So we always look to you for uh, wisdom about those about those topics. We're just delighted to have you back here finally. You've been a busy man and, and uh, glad we can get you back on our calendar. Well, thank you so much. And you know, your discussion of, of actually putting your preparedness into action is something that I wanted to talk about today. And that's the Dunning-Kruger effect. Some people in the audience might know about it. Others might not. It's, a, it's named for the Cornell psychologist, David Dunning, and his then grad student, Justin Kruger. It's an observation that people who are ignorant or unskilled in a given domain, they tend to overestimate their abilities in that domain or in that subject matter so as not to seem unknowledgeable or unable. And I think we witness that in survival and preparedness and even homesteading a lot. Uh, so in short, you know, there are people who have a limited knowledge of, of a subject matter, okay. and they overestimate that knowledge and that ability to perform tasks. And I think as we all look to enrich our own family, to become more prepared, we're going to inevitably experience people who express the Dunning-Kruger effect on one side or another. Now, there's two sides to it, of course. There's the overestimation of your own understanding and ability and then there's those that uh, underestimate their own understanding and ability and let me give you an example uh, as we were building out our homestead here I'm no electrician and so I reached out to somebody local who I knew had personal knowledge and experience with electrical work okay and I asked them if he could help and his immediate reaction was I'm not an expert I'm not an electrician. I can show you what I know. So he experienced the underestimation through the Dunning-Kruger effect, where he didn't, he didn't estimate his ability at an expert level, but still offered to help. On the opposite side of that, I have met people who grossly overestimated their ability. And that's going to be very dangerous for survival and preparedness. And we rely on people or now in times of peace where we're thinking about, you know, bringing people into our group. Those people are going to be needed to protect your family 
you're going to need to not worry about them with your children if you have them. You don't want them stealing from you. And you might rely on their skills for long-duration emergencies. Imagine if you had somebody who told you up and down that they knew first aid, and they could literally repeat textbook first aid to you. And they are able to convince themselves and convince others that they know this subject matter. Right. Without seeing them do it, without watching them actually perform their skill, we have no way of really knowing. And so that's the Dunning-Kruger effect. And I think that we each need to kind of vet that out, not just in ourselves, but in those that we're talking about staying with if a crisis were to strike. Because imagine if you had to rely on somebody who said they were an expert marksman who said they knew security and could run a patrol or just on the easier side who said they knew how to garden. And then at the end of the day, when push came to shove, you found that they were all talk and they had convinced themselves they knew how because they read some books about it, but weren't actually able to do it. Yeah. We have had the Bo. Uh, sorry. We've had Bo Dobozinski, who's the director of training at, uh, at uh, sealed preparedness in in the Twin Cities, uh, talks he does tactical training and leadership training with groups of people, and he said that this is a rampant, is an epidemic problem, especially in the current generation. We we are conditioned by television and by movies to think that things just happen if you if you've got right. the the tools and you've got the intent you can just do anything and he said people think they really over grossly overestimate that uh, you know a single person with a handgun can take down a, a much heavier armed assailant who, or, or even an unarmed assailant who's coming at them that that one shot's gonna stop you know an attacker and that kind of stuff they just think that as soon as you hear bang somebody's gonna drop on the ground and he says uh, you know there's there's so mo much um, uh, missed opportunities to de-escalate the situation or to e right. to evade and introduce barriers and get help and do all these other things. People think, oh, I don't have to do that because I've got it covered because I, I went to this one weekend uh, tactical training class or whatever. So that's uh, a... <laughs> right. It also reminds me, um, there's a book called How to Measure Anything, uh, The Value of Intangibles in Business, and, and it talks in there about how we tend, by personality type, have a tendency to either be overestimators or underestimators of our, our overconfident or underconfident and I don't know if this is similar to what you're talking about there but it probably is. but they actually have exercises you can do which are kind of like little trivia tests you give yourself that uh, you first estimate uh, how what you think will be the answers that are going to fall within the 90 percent chance of being correct and then you self calibrate yourself so when you get you take this test of 10 questions or 20 questions you look at it at the end and, and you you thought you were answering at 90 percent confidence and you find out you're only 7 or 60 or 50 percent accurate you go whoa I tend yeah, to yeah. Over overestimate my accuracy so then you take the test again with different questions and you kind of recalibrate yourself and you keep doing that until you can actually hit it right. Um, it, when I That's say right, right, I don't exactly mean being like perfect. That. I mean being realistic about your abilities, yeah. judge, correctly right. judging your own abilities. That sounds exactly like the Dunning-Kruger effect. And actually, the 1999 paper that launched the effect in psychology was called Unskilled and Unaware of It. And it <laughs> Cornell undergrads, and it gave them a 20-item test. So I think that the test that you're talking about might be modeled against that. Okay, all right. And they look they had to look at their own abilities and the 10, the 10% 10 of people who had the lowest score. So the lowest 10% thought themselves within the higher 70% of knowledge. Okay. And so it really is an overt misunderstanding of one's own ability to the point where they even, they believe it themselves. Of course. And they know just enough to be dangerous. Yeah. Yeah, and that can get you pretty far in the modern world. I mean, y you know, and pe maybe people have seen the movie uh, Catch Me If You Can, where this fellow just kind of bluffs his way through it, all kinds of different careers yeah. and leaps and that kind of thing. But in a sense, with everybody having smartphones on their hips and instant access to all the information known by the human family for since the beginning of time and all kinds of people uh, being willing to just kind of make leaps uh, without putting in the actual time, the years of discipline, whatever, 10,000 hours it takes to master, you know, most things, that kind of thing. Uh, everybody's looking for right. a shortcut, not everybody, but yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah, epidemic. Sure. And so uh, so yeah. you mentioned, you yeah, implied that the, the solution there is to observe 
and get physical confirmation so that you really have confidence in in someone's ability is that is that where you're going with that or how how, how what's the remedy well how do you build a for example a support community and know that yeah this this person really does have the skills that they that they say they do well I think there's two I think there's a, a generality of two types of people who seek out others for a preparedness group or even just accepting others into their own close circle. And those two very genera- big generalities are the kumbaya type who let's hold hands and figure it out as we go. And then there's the strategic uh, vetting process where it starts with communication and maybe after months, maybe after a year, you spend real physical time with that person and you have to really either see the fruits of their labor i'll give you an example on the soft side is someone who's great at gardening watch them watch the fruit of that watch what okay. happens there sure and or house building or marksmanship you know there's going to be fruit of their skill okay and spend physical time with them and actually put them through physical scenarios and let them show you how they would do it. You know, I, I, I certainly wouldn't want to trust the CPR of my family to somebody who says they know how to do it, and they end up breaking the ribs of, an, of a toddler because they didn't know that you need to treat a toddler differently. Okay. Yeah, some of those situations, you're right. They would, if, It depends how... Um, I'm trying to think of ways how to say this, but basically... If you're just developing a relationship with that person, it isn't like you meet somebody and go, "Oh, really? You're interested in the similar topics? Well, I'm going to put you through some tests." I mean, that's not, that's not how you that's not how you approach it. This, these these situations would have to be organically present themselves, or you could arrange them, or whatever. But they, but you have to be observant and take your time uh, to build that confidence, that that base of confidence in in yourself and in others. And I guess that gets back to what you often have have preached for years, and that's test yourself go out and do building a fire with wet wood on a windy day and things like that don't just think oh yeah i could probably do that if i needed to yes right exactly and, and i think that that covers almost every aspect of survival and preparedness and even down to economic preparedness because if you think you can get by with x amount of dollars you need to really be able to get by with x amount of dollars or with no money at all for a month and see how you fare Makes sense. Now you had talked. So to, another. Go ahead. I was wondering because you had, you're talking about um, aspects that are important to forming uh, communities of interdependence and interreliance because that strengthens you. There's there's a strength in the group. Um, you've talked a lot. In fact, I was going to mention that earlier when introducing you about the connections that you have in the preparedness community. One of those connections is about communications. You've, in, you've interviewed other specialists in in communications on your. Uh, full spectrum survival channel. It's been something that I know is um, a short. It's a shortcoming of my personal preparedness, and we're looking at how we can shore that up. But uh, you were talking in our pre-interview about mesh networks as an alternative to some other uh, past technologies that are available for communicating in the case of, a, of yes. an emergency. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, absolutely. So, as you may know, uh, I know we've done some talks offline that. I program in Python. I do a lot of Internet of Things, personal programming, personal jobs there. And mesh networks has always been an interest to me. Uh, A couple of years back, the name brand Gotenna brought out a mesh network that kind of hit the mainstream. It was labeled as a, uh, a, a potential disaster preparedness item or maybe just a camping item to be a little bit more mainstream. And at the time they came out, I understand that they were the mesh network that they released. And for anyone who doesn't know what a mesh network is, it's a network of devices or communication protocols that can talk with each other without the reliance on a larger grid. So uh, if you had a Morse code that you typed out between, uh, you know, CB radios or walkie talkies, uh, GMRS in a local area, you would be in effect building your own mesh network if people relayed that information back and forth. Um, So the Gotenna brand allows you to pair your cell phone, has to be a smartphone, with their ready model. Now, what I have found kind of beautiful about them, because I got my hands on them trying to 
jump start. And like you said, we all kind of try to take the easier road because I could program my own, but it wouldn't be adoptable on a larger scale. So other people that are in my immediate community or in my preparedness group, they wouldn't be able to adopt it without understanding what I know about programming. And so this really kind of shone a light for me that I was able to say, okay, well, let me try this and see if it, if it worked. So it allows you to create your own signal. They're pretty simple. They are a little bit pricey, so I want everyone to kind of get the idea of whether the cost is worth it for them. But let me talk about the pros and the cons. Uh, it runs on MURS, and people might know the MURS frequency from uh, the really good driveway alerts that you can get you know, a mile away with and have no problem telling you that, that you've got an intruder that just tripped the alarm. Hmm. Uh, there's not so much... Uh, communication depreciation on the MURS frequency, but it allows you to send text and GPS location between any connected uh, smartphone using this mesh network. Kind of the beauty about it is that it's out of the box working. You get the device, you pair it up to your phone's Bluetooth, and you can speak with anyone within range of that device through text and GPS communication. It has without, of, without relying on the phone company's cell phone tower system? No, t no cell towers, no okay. nothing. Okay. So the, the grid is completely down, but you're able to use your small backpack solar panel to keep your cell phone charged. You're going to be communicating with those people. Now, what kind of range are you talking about? The range that I have tested, and I'm in a, a very wooded, hilly area That's of right. Alabama. Yep. The, the range that I have tested has gotten me between one and two miles, depending on other variations of the day. Now, one of the beauties of, go ahead. Is that a single hop? I mean, uh, if you that's, had that's others in your group that were spread out, would that, could that extend further? Because it, there can, is like a relay capability or something? That's right. That's one of the beauties about, that's what really turned me on to this particular device is that it takes no additional programming, no nothing. You drop one node in the middle and it automatically bounces all communication between all connected devices. So you, you're talking about a, a potentially limitless range, but of course, you know, you don't want to have 10,000 devices out there. So you're able to reach easily your neighborhood, easily your patrolling area, things like that. And one of the beauties about it is that Whereas if you're running out of range with a walkie-talkie yeah. or a GMRS, something like that, if you're running out of range, you have a real hard time communicating with that person. Because you're not able to hear exactly what is being talked about due to static uh, communication loss, with these, it's text only. So if it goes through, you see it and hear 100% of what goes through. There's no guessing what that person said. Mm -hmm. Another beauty about it is that there's send and receive notifications. So as the communication goes from one node to another, it lets you know where it hit and where it was accepted, received, and it sends back a confirmation. So let's take just a, a real quick scenario. You've got people in your group, and maybe this is your neighborhood. Maybe, you, maybe a disaster struck and you have people who made it to a retreat location. You set up this mesh network, and you're able to know that your communication went to, on a soft side, grandma's house, uh, or a patrol unit, or, uh, you know, Doug who lives up the street. You know it got there because you got the confirmation back that it went there. It also sends GPS location, so you know exactly where that person's at, and someone back at the, the base, someone back at home site, can see where everyone else is. And so I think there's some pluses to it. Uh, I have no affiliation with Gotenna. It just helped me fill a gap that I knew that I had. What kind of uh, security or privacy do they have? Because at first blush, it makes it sound like anybody and everybody who's out there knows exactly what you're saying and what, where you are and everything. Is there any concept of, no, this is just my channel or our group or something, encryption or anything like that? So there's end-to-end -end encryption. So it gets encrypted on your particular device. Okay. And whatever device you're linked to, 
decrypts it on that side. Okay. Uh, there, so other people can join it and they can link their own devices. And let's just say, for example, a, a neighborhood were to take this up and you've got 20 different houses there. Sure. All those, you know, three houses are friends, but they're not friends with other people. Those three houses can link each other and the nodes will still pass the information just like your information is on the internet, but it the email only goes to your intended recipient. It's just like that, except it's in, it's, it, it is encrypted. Um, okay. And let me see if I can find any information before we're done here about the type of encryption. Last I remember it, it was as good or better than Bitcoin. We also wanted to talk, and we didn't get a chance. We thought we were going to have you on about a month ago, but we ended up not being able to get our calendars to align. You were going to talk to us about the what you call the long game on gun control. Again, that's an example of an important, uh, could be a life-saving or a food-gathering tool that that people have uh, or or may have a question whether they have been practiced, you know, using it and using it proficiently and that sort of thing. But um, what about uh, your whole series you were doing on how you became people's worst nightmare on, and how you were gonna you know take away their stuff. Um, what what considerations do you have to share with us about the long game on gun control? Okay, real quick before I get into that, for anyone sure. who's still interested, I was able to find it. Uh, it's private one to one and group message encryption using a two hundred and twenty four bit elliptic curve, public private key ciphering. The only exception is that you're you're able to use an option that says shout or emergency. Oh. Okay. And that that broadcast to anybody. So where you want to be, where you want to be found. found. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Exactly. You could broadcast it to anyone who has a re uh, receipt of it. Um, okay. Back to the long game on gun control. A couple of things tie into this. At any time I discuss gun control and the coming classification and final regulation. Of, gun, of guns in the United States of America, of other countries of the world where it is easy, easier or less easy to yeah. get guns, I receive a huge amount of very manly, very alpha, they will never take my gun, they'll take it from my dead cold hands, yep. let them try. But we have so many cases in our world where they have come and taken away the rights and taken away the weapons of the people of those societies. And sure, a few jumped up and a few tried to fight it off. And those were the first dead. And as soon as people started seeing that, they all backed up and let it go. That's how tyrannies exist. Well, that's and how these things take place. If that's the mountain, I would even say the foothills of the mountain, we could look around us and point to maybe hundreds and hundreds of examples of where our constitutional liberties, our, our God-given natural rights, all, all of our common sense autonomy and, and that have, have been uh, slipped away and, and, or voluntarily uh, abdicated by people, whether it's from taxation or whether it's from just an encroachment on, on civil liberties and things like that. So our track record is not very good. It's kind of like getting back to what you were before about, uh, so you say you're a master gardener and all you got is weeds in your backyard and, and dead vines. Um, our yeah. track record as a, as a culture and as a generation is, uh, I would claim, abysmal until proven otherwise in, in the arena of um, doing anything effective to stand up for protecting our our natural rights so yeah that's, i hear what right. you're and saying let's face it, you know every every government of the world wants one thing power and all and by it control that's why it's a government it's meant to govern the people control the people in that society and maybe it's not always maniacal maybe it's not always evil and tyranny in mind but they want power and they want control, or else they wouldn't be in a power of control, or in a position of power and control. And the threat to that control and the threat to that power is an armed and communicating society. Because and things can Armed, change. communicating, and, and thinking. <laughs> and that's right, and thinking. And so they're taking the long game, and that's what I try to express to people. They're not gonna come for guns tomorrow. London is already, I'm sure everyone here has seen it. The mayor of London released a statement making it illegal to carry a knife saying that there was absolutely no reason 
a person should be on the street with a knife. That, it, that just shows the asinine level of where we're getting to as a world, that there's no reason for a person to be in possession of a knife on the street. Uh, let's, if we go back to our grandfather's generation, uh, basically every schoolboy and every teenager and every grown man had a pocket knife in their pocket, and, they, and it comes in handy uh, frequently, maybe once a week, maybe once a month. Very, it's a very handy tool, and sometimes it comes in uh, even more handy as, as a self-defense or ability to protect yourself or others, but it's, uh, I, I have gotten out of the habit of carrying a, a knife because I had to surrender it once when I was on jury duty, twice at the airport. Yeah. I just finally gave up. At, I, I finally just thought, you know, dang it, I'm going to quit giving away my, my dang good knives for free to these people where I keep ca taking yeah, places exactly. I shouldn't have it. And that's that's sort of the long game that they're going after. It's not going to happen tomorrow. It's not going to happen in a year without great circumstances taking place that threaten control and power of a governing body. Without that, they're okay waiting 10 years. They're okay waiting 20 years. They're okay waiting 50 years and slowly taking away their rights and manipulating and shaping the laws. And let's look at privacy. 50 years ago, 40 years ago, do you think that they would have been okay? Do you think the society of America would have been okay with the current privacy and, and security invasion that we experience every the, the day. Constant surveillance of every every form check. of our communication, every form of our uh, movement and interaction. Exactly. And, yeah. In, in fact, uh, my wife was just showing me this week a new communication she got, and I'm trying to remember if it was from Facebook or Google or where it was from, but it was this new oath. Uh, uh, opt-in opt-out thing and it's saying we're going to start yeah, tracking right. your everything and it's like well five years ago people were called conspiracy theorists and and you know tinfoil hat wearers if they even claim that that's the direction things were definitely going to go and now it's just like no you will you will opt in if you want to use any of these services and you know i have so many friends who are a little bit older than me they're in a generation of uh you know they're in their 50s and 60s where they still have a good amount of fight in them and they they say, I'll never let it happen. But that's not the problem. The problem, and let me give you a study from the University of British Columbia. The summary of this study, which was published just, just this week, contrary to popular stereotypes, young men, that is millennial men, are likely to be selfless, socially engaged, and altruistic individuals. So is altruism a bad thing? Well, no, it's not, because the care for others above your own is not a bad thing. But it is a manipulable, you can manipulate that trait in people. That's the type of trait that you can hold a gun to suit little Susie's head and the man will do whatever you say. And so this altruism, this change in social behavior of males in the first world will be what the ability to control guns, to take away all of your rights, in the near future and what, what will lead to an authoritative or a totalitarian or a direct tyranny government because we're going to get to a point where the fire that's in the men and women of today is extinguished and so when you and I are too old to fight are too old to stand up for things that are grossly against our rights as a human being as a person of this earth it's that next generation that is relied upon to be self-sustainable and survival-minded of, of self, but they'll have the fight so far removed out of them or so far drugged out of them because one in five right now are on antidepressants. It'll be so far away from their ability to say, this is not right and I'm doing something about it, that no matter who wants to, they can walk all over them. You know, there's, there's, and that's the long game. I'm glad you brought up the thing about drugs. Um, again, five years ago, you would absolutely have been considered a conspiracy theorist, an extreme, uh, you know, irrational person to have, to have taken the discussion in that direction. Just this week, we interviewed. In fact, it's going to be posted later this week. An interview with the uh, FDA researcher doctor who has talked about how the average testosterone level in men has dropped 50 percent in the past generation. About how. Right. Um, the prevalent use now, which was never before, of uh, 
even uh, plastic water bottles and uh, these thermally printed receipts that have chemicals on them that, that goes through your skin and raises the estrogen <laughs> level in men and lowers their testosterone. We basically have, in addition to any uh, psychosocial pressures and any kind of um, uh, anesthesiologist <clears throat> I'm trying to say, I mean, we've had Jerry Robinson on from Bankruptcy of, Bankruptcy of Our Nation, author, talking about how the anesthesiologist is the guy who shows up to numb you down before the surgeon comes in for the cut. And they gave examples right. through the media, through education, through entertainment, through all kinds of cultural uh, norm setting and, frankly, um, cloaked bullying of people that basically shaming and blaming and name calling you if you don't conform 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 and get beaten down to where you go okay well, I'm gonna be a I want to be a good guy not a bad guy so I'm gonna I'm gonna quit behaving in ways that are being labeled as hate hateful or whatever when those are just absolutely right. the traditional ways of of normal self-defense self-preservation looking out for your best interest of your your, your individual self your individual family, your individual culture, your individual nation, the nation state itself, uh, on and on, all of those things are now uh, politically incorrect. And but in but on top of all that, cultural stuff, social stuff, you've got the actual feminization and demasculinization of an entire uh, the, the entire living generation of, of males on this on this planet right now. That's right. Yeah, and, and, and you know, everyone has their own personal. Um, considerations with their push for gender movements it, to me in my opinion it's exactly that same argument that it is a move away from you, they're trying to make you so confused about who you are and what you are that when a man looks down he doesn't know what that is and he doesn't know what what that should do and so he says instead i'm, I'm gender fluid i'm gender neutral that doesn't make me who I am. That's really the thinking. That's the mentality of an entire generation. And I know this because I have a lot of communication with people of that generation that that is their thinking, yeah. 100%. Yeah, and and that's and where so, I was going with that too. And you're, you're pointing right on it on the topic of um, gender, for example. And that is absolutely critical to uh, our identity as individuals, as is, What's the definition of the family? What's the definition of marriage? Mm -hmm. What's the definition of right. your rights as a, as a self-preservation and, and as a country? But it goes even more fundamental than that to thought itself and rationality and the ability to make distinctions, the ability to stand firm on on unchanging you know, timeless principles and that kind of thing. It's like, ah, well, no, everything, my truth, your truth, and, and with re moral relativism and emotional uh, dominance over rationality is all plays into this too as far as our loss of our ability to even make and the and the and the co-option of language uh the abuse of language and the use of words to change to twist the meanings of what things used to mean and what they now mean to where you get somebody i believe it was socrates always talked about before we debate something let's define our terms and uh, right. and when that that um when the tools of language itself are being twisted and distorted to where people can't even uh, speak clearly and uh, think clearly and mean things clearly anymore. Um, that's a huge, uh, what, was the, what was the quote from the Revolu American Revolutionary War about the pen being mightier than the sword and the French Revolution and so on is, is like, you no, know, if, if the written word and the ability of people to, like you mentioned earlier, to communicate with each other and, 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 and exercise their power in, through firearms or whatever, um, but I, I threw it. That's what I threw in there thinking, because now it's where we ended up. So thank you. I, and I think that's the real danger that we have, because look, look at the values that we all place upon survivalism or preparedness or homesteading or just self-reliance. Those were the everyday considerations yeah. of our grandparents. Just normal. That was just life. Assumed. That's, yeah. Right. That's how life had to be. And now it's so so far away from the norm countercultural extremism think, yep <laughs> it's, yeah it's very extreme and how could you do that and why would you want to do that and so the real danger there is that we are literally not being led necessarily to slaughter but being led to a life of servitude and helplessness and look at the yeah. and helplessness and look at the press release from Goldman Sachs from where they met with their investors 
and they questioned whether it was a good business model to cure an individual. And they looked at all of the bioengineering uh, conglomerates of the world, and they, they pointed out all of the different ones that had like hepatitis cures and uh, different bioengineered cures, and they said, look at how their profits dropped. So is it really a good business model to provide a cure for people rather than what they said and quote this recurring revenue? Right. Right. They don't, they don't want you healthy. They don't want you free to do what you want to do. They want you working all day, buying stuff all day, and then taking your medicine all night. And that's really the idea of a slave. And so people who get caught up in current, uh, like racial toils or really anything that mirrors but doesn't reflect the fact that we are all still slaves today, and even more so because we have no ability or very a lessening ability to get out of this. We have to, as people, make changes in ourselves. And so I was talking with somebody who's in my personal survival group. We were talking just yesterday, and he said – what what can we do and what's our timeline and i told him the timeline really always has to be unknown there's things that are on the near horizon and there's things that at any time could take could take place and shift the timeline of a disaster you have natural events earthquakes wildfires volcanoes that uh, previous volcanoes on our earth have sent us into decades-long winters you have all these natural events, plus you have an earthquake that could take place over a nuclear under a nuclear power plant that's on a fault line. All of these things, not including world war, not including uh, nuclear radiation, not including a pandemic. Everything is really on the horizon, and they could shift our timeline to a, a regional disaster at any moment. So he looked and said, well, what can we do? And my answer to that is – Live like your grandparents did and your great-grandparents did today and start that today. If you're in a 30-year mortgage or a refinance 30-year mortgage, consider moving somewhere that you can sell your house and buy your entire piece of land because that's what your grandparents did. And have a garden because that is what they did. Can your food, protect yourself, know how to shoot and hunt, and be self-sustaining, not to the point where you don't need anything else, because let's face it, you can't grow chocolate in every environment. And if your wife wants chocolate, that's okay to get her some. <laughs> that's the old wants, saying is, you know, uh, if a woman is upset, you know, try to try to talk with her and gently and understand. And if, if she continues to remain more upset, retreat to a safe distance and throw chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, but live like our grandparents did today because that's our best position for a long duration emergency and it will come as you look at history moral decrepitness increased same time a society's value decreased right. so that is to say the time of romans is now right. and that empire did not last and our empire won't last right that's we've had uh, david morgan from the uh, the Morgan Report on talking about the the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, which is available on online. If people just Google for the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse movie, it's free. Um, but one of the principles in there is that the every empire goes through four major stages, and the last stage is the exhaustion stage, and it's characterized among other things by excess in uh, decadent lifestyles, but also in moral, uh, de you know, uh, abandonment of of traditional moral uh, structure. And the rejection of that, right. in, in, in always in the terms of uh, freedom and enlightenment, and uh, you don't have to that's look right. very far to go. Uh, wait a minute, that I think uh, that's not a new idea. That's a really old idea. If you go back and look about the Garden of Eden, that's the first uh, chance of just throwing off the shackles of nobody's the boss of me. It's kind of like the toddler uh, self exerting itself, and we think that that's very mature. Uh, something else right, you mentioned. Exactly. <laughs> Um, something else you mentioned, oh, uh, yes, about living like your grandparents said. Uh, most people go, uh, you, can just, you just feel yourself just inwardly grimacing. They think about all the hard work and all the chapped hands and the sore back and everything. And, and it's like, <laughs> it's only, oh, I feel sorry for those Amish people because they got to work so hard. And I just, I just show up and order my, my takeout. It's so much easier. I can do it online from my smartphone. And 
yeah. But but if if you look at decade by decade, what we've what we've allowed people to do across, and we we address a lot of these. I should have mentioned our sister channel we just started is called Healing Yourself Life, and we're going to be getting into a lot of these things. But um, just a kind of a whirlwind is that decade by decade over the past century, it has been just unprecedented in human history, the amount of aspects of our human lives, our personal lives, the lives that belong to us, that have been taken away from us and then sold back to us. And you mentioned it earlier when you said Goldman Sachs saying it's not a good business model to heal individuals. To cure someone. And it's just, it's just like, right. now wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. Since when is healing and being wellness a business model. In other words, where did, where, where did as, every aspect of my life, whether it's children uh, born at home, the first, okay, here's a question. Have we asked this before? You know which American president was the first one n not born at home? The first American president not born at home? Can you just guess? Um, I'd have to say uh, past the 70s. Yeah, it was Jimmy Carter. And uh, Carter. E every every American president prior to Jimmy Carter was born at home. But now, they have taken that part of people's lives away from them and selling it back to them, and not just selling it back to them with about two to three thousand dollars worth of midwife care, but thirty to a hundred thousand right. dollars worth of uh, of scheduled cesareans and all kinds of uh, you know spinal blocks and that sort of stuff, and and on and on. Uh, educating your children it used to be natural province of family. Parents were the natural in in you know innate educators of their children. And now that's been professionally taken away from you. In fact, you, in some European countries, you, you don't have the option of homeschooling, even if you want to. Uh, and that's right. And on and on and on. And in, in California, where they, they'll take the, they'll take the water resources and then they bottle it and sell it back to you. So, oh, by the way, now it comes with estrogen causing chemicals in it. But, but the, uh, the whole thing of, of every aspect of our lives, uh, our ability to feed ourselves, protect ourselves, raise our children, educate ourselves, Live, own land, et cetera, et cetera, um, has all, you become a cog in a business model, somebody else's business model, somebody else's right. profits, profit sheet. And I think that's one of the things you're talking about is, is waking up, kind of taking the red pill and waking up in that matrix and going, whoa, when did I sign up to be a pawn in somebody's business model? As though that's the best thing that's going to be know, how to take care of myself. I, I have talked with people and, and there's a, there's a certain allure that everyone has to being debt free. And I'm sure a lot of people listening make a good sum of money. And a lot of people listening make very little money. And I've always fallen into the only make, only strive to make as much as I need. That's what, that's all I've wanted to do. And I'd rather live small and not be forced to always chase that next dollar mm -hmm. than I would work my all my entire life because that's part of their business model is you work all of your good years and you're allowed to retire which historically was a term for taking off the old used wooden tires and putting new ones on so you're allowed to retire and live the rest of your days but that to me was never never a plan so what i was getting at is that I'm, there's a, a lure of people to pick up all your stuff and move to somewhere that you can afford to buy outright and never have to work anymore. But there's a mental block there. And a lot of times that mental block is family. And so many people, but my family is here. My extended family is here. Okay. Let me, let me say something, and, and this might upset some people. And I, for that, I apologize beforehand. I ask that you forgive me. But if your family would rather you stay a slave for the rest of your life instead of moving with you to a place of freedom, in my opinion, you should move anyways. Because they're not having your best interest and our next generation and your children's children's best interests in mind. I moved away from my family, even though they thought I was just throwing them to the wind. Hmm. You know, why would I do this? This was hmm. so hurtful for them. But I could not continue to chase what needs to be chased in city life. I instead had to say, I need to move, one, for disaster preparedness, and two, for my current livelihood, that my children will have something, and their children will have something. And it's not much. It's very meager. I live on two acres with another acre on the kitty corner. It's really not much, but it is mine. 
And I think everybody listening should take that into consideration. If you don't have that which is yours right now, it is doable. I purchased a piece of land with owner financing, got the deed in my hand for $6,000. That's not very much money. That's doable. That's a doable amount of money for people. Yep. And so I think that you should take the advantage while it's here because this lifestyle is becoming more and more extreme and see what you can do to put your family in a position of perpetual health where you can get away from the, the lifestyle that enriches servitude and health disorders. Yep. What are your thoughts on it, Dunnigan? Yeah, and I, and I completely agree. There's a, a book I've read just recently. It's not a new book, but I finally read it after having bought it at a garage sale several years ago called The Four Hour Work Week. And he talks in there about, the author talks in there about that very principle of what, what have we um, been hoodwinked into doing is, is working our entire productive life for someone else and to amass things, uh, telling ourselves that one day, one day when I've, when I've really reached um, you know, a huge pile of, of wealth, then I can finally uh, do the thing that I wanted to do or do the thing that's closer to my family or whatever. And he right. says, just, just be with your family now. Just, just do those things and get close to them and, and living small. My wife and I have also been starting to research some things about um, traveling around and, and um, uh, whether it's RVing or, or camping, that kind of thing. And uh, one of the quotes mm-hmm. that just keeps coming back to me that I, that I read in some of these uh, uh, blog sites, it said, it said, go small, go cheap, go now. And uh, it yeah, seems right. to echo some of what you had shared as well. And uh, just that starts with reflecting and it starts with questioning, um, am I really intentionally choosing this or am I just kind of falling, falling into kind of a, a group think and just kind of following a pattern of, oh, I guess I need a bigger house and I guess I need the, the second or third car and I guess I need all these expensive bills and, and, and then there, I guess I got to go to work to pay for all this stuff. Taxation is another important right. part of that and there's a lot of those activities that you mentioned um, help you to opt out of the taxation cycle too because if you're raising your own food by gardening, um, then you're not having to go pay tax on all that packaged food and restaurant food and stuff like that that you would have been buying. It's probably healthier for you as well. Um, that was, uh, th- there's so much more that we can talk about. We've, we've interviewed both uh, Galen Lehman and, uh, and uh, his uh, sister from uh, Lehman's Hardware in Kidron, Ohio, where they've been a premier provider for over 60 years of off-grid and electric free living, uh, both to the Amish uh, community as well as anyone else who's uh, independence-minded. And they do talk about recapturing those those lost arts, those lost skills uh, that our former generation just took for, that, that was essential, that was the foundation of, of life um, and being able to uh, take care of yourself. Um, so. Uh, we got to have you back on there. I know that we're not going to have time to get to the other topics we'd, we'd hoped we could today about future water scarcity. And I want to get in where you just touched on your homesteading. We want to get into that more next time we have you on. And uh, But I forgot to mention, <laughs> this is the first uh, interview we've done together where I'm facing the camera. And that just happened yes, that's a, right. that's uh, a, a few months ago. Thing. It was something that I didn't want to do for, gosh, the previous four years uh, out of the idea that uh, putting myself out publicly and uh, facially recognizable would be um, limiting to uh, to both may, perhaps my family's future own endeavors. Uh, future endeavors, that kind of thing. And and finally realized that um, there had been so many inquiries and interest on the part of uh, guests, but but also uh, of our viewing audience. And then also my wife and I contemplating uh, launching this sister channel, Healing Yourself Life. Uh, so folks, do check it out. Go to healingyourself.life and see that we're just starting to, to launch out into a whole new, we'll be talking about uh, herbal healing and uh, natural healing and opting out of the expensive medical system and the cures that are so much, ways of getting uh, not dependent on uh, pain killing drugs and medications and on, and on treatments that actually make you better rather than and healthier and improve your immune system and, and home birth and homeschooling and that kind of stuff. But just the, the bottom line is if we're going to be talking about this stuff and maybe even doing uh, lecture tours and that kind of stuff, uh, my face is going to be out there anyway. So here we are. So uh, thanks well, for and, asking. You know, I, I think, yeah, no problem. I, when you came on our channel, Full Spectrum Survival, I think it was probably a, a little over a year ago. Yeah, uh, We went to some good length. 
Yeah, we went to some good lengths together to keep your face hidden. And I, I get asked a lot, why do you put yourself out there? Uh-huh. If you're a survivalist, if you're a preparedness, why are you putting yourself out there? And I ask them, why wouldn't I? And their answer almost 75% of the time is because the government will know where to go to and your friends and neighbors will know where to go to. Uh-huh. And the first, the first answer I have for them is if you don't think that the government knows exactly who you are and every facet about you, then you are living a deluded life because then you don't really understand the current disaster that we're in for privacy and personal security. That's because true. It is gone. You, you have a profile built on you on every aspect of your life from where your ping of your cell phone picks up, your patterns of uh, fast food restaurants, your things that you look at online. Unless you're using a burner phone every single day, changing it out, using a new microcomputer with a new Tor set up every single day from a computer that's not yours, from an, an Ethernet cable that's not yours, they know exactly who you are. So don't, don't let that fear stop you from pressing as a human being. And then the rest of it is, you know, your friends or family will know what kind of person you are. And I'm okay with that. I, I'm okay with my friends and family knowing what kind of person I am because anybody who ever came to try to do harm to my family, I would, I would treat with the exact same manner of repercussion. That, I wouldn't care whether they knew me from somewhere or they were just a, a meth head stranger down the street. They're all getting treated the same way. So there is really no reason for me personally not to put it out there. And I'm, I'm really glad and I'm proud that you and your wife made the decision to say, this is who we are and let's let everybody know because there's a certain amount of credibility that comes with it when you can see that person and look into their eyes and you know that they mean exactly what they're saying. That's right. Well, Brad, we've got so much more to talk about and uh, we'd love to have you back on. Let's not let it be as long as it's been this last time and have you back Please. on again soon yeah. so that we can uh, we can delve into more of those topics because we really do want to find out more about um, lessons you've learned from, from pra- putting into practice on your homestead and uh, and the other topics about water scarcity and so on. And also the one that you had proposed and we didn't get to uh, before about um, about uh, preparing for the predator who is more prepared than you are maybe about how to take away your your uh, carefully amassed yes, uh, stockpiles of you stashes. Know, we put our polls for our next videos, we put a lot of those on our Patreon channel. If anyone wants to check out our Patreon account, it's patreon.com forward slash full spectrum survival. Every month at the $10 level, we go out and take high-resolution macro photography. We put a a survival preparedness tip that is associated with that, and we mail that physically for people to put in their bag-out bags every month. And we put polls on there for what they want to see next. Last one we did was on solar because everyone thinks, okay, I'm going to get solar. I'll have power when power goes out. That, to me, as a potential predator, is a target. You're lighting yourself up for everyone to see. If, if I got mad, I could just take out your panels or worse. And I asked them, what do you want to see next? And they all said, my water threat, because that's another threat, because that's the next place a predator is going to go. If they want to do you harm in a disaster environment, they want to take away your ability to drink. You've only got three days from that point. That's right. They can either poison you, take it away, manipulate it, move you. So. I want to get to that video, and I want to talk about that with your uh, with your audience next We'd time. love that. Let's plan on having that uh, real soon, so thank you. We've been speaking with Brad Harris. He's the founder and host of FullSpectrumSurvival.com. He's been with us here again on Reluctant Preppers. Brad, as always, thank you for joining us. Thank you, and thank you, everybody, for listening.